Welcome to a very special Autogefühl episode with Thomas with the Smart EQ42 Cabriolet, so the electric version of this tiny vehicle and also a sustainability special not only about cars, we will talk about the sustainability of cars and also EVs of course, but also give you more insight into other fields. Very interesting. For example, what about electric boats? Small ones or also bigger ferries or sustainable furniture and a sustainable form of new urban living. Well, we will raise a lot of questions, of course, and give you a lot of different information and perspectives. So join us on this special feature. It will be very interesting. I can promise you we will face different severe weather situations as well. And also, of course, focus here, as always, on our car content. Then in full HD, full screen and full X. Let's go. Welcome also to Kölnhorn. Welcome to Copenhagen, also one of my favorite cities here up in the north. Very forward moving city and this will also play a role throughout this special feature. And talking about forward moving, Smart will do the whole lineup all electric very soon. In North America they are already full electric and they will also globally move all electric. So the petrol engine that they are available at the moment still will soon also fade out. Here in the front, the electric version, you don't see much differences. There's this EQ logo. The EQ is the Daimler electric brand now. Recently we've shown you the Mercedes EQC and both Smart and Mercedes will use this EQ brand for showing their electric lineup. You can also get those LED daytime running lights here and I would recommend you to get the LED package for the Smart. Otherwise, the um, no, it, it looks not so modern and also you get some more lighting power for the everyday driving life, so to say. Um, there are a lot of different extras you can pick for this car. The base price, by the way, is 15,000 if you go for a petrol convertible and the extra price for the electric version is 10,000 or 25,000 euros in Germany and then some more extras. But if you think, oh, 10,000 euros extra for the electric version, but you already get some more stuff inside. For example, you have the AC then or the automatic transmission, which always comes with an electric vehicle, is already included. So it's not directly 10,000 euros extra in price, um, but still it is way more expensive. Maybe the battery price will drop down in the future a little bit. We'll also talk about battery price and also the supply chain, for example, later on in this feature. 2 meters 69 or 8 foot 8 is the total shortness of this vehicle and it's really so peculiar you know there's also the 4.4 available which is basically identical with the Renault Twingo but this one here the 4.2 is a standalone and it always comes in a two color scheme if you want so you can also pick this Tridion cell in the same color and this one for example also in black that is possible um, also what I recommend there's a matte gray available for example and then you combine with with black so that would be probably my choice to have a sporty look it starts with 15 inch steel rims but those ones here are the 15 inch aluminum optional pretty nice styling as well and then there are also 16 inch aluminum available but you know maybe they make the ride too stiff the ride itself i can already tell you so far is already quite stiff because they may have to make it stiff that the car doesn't flip over due to this very short wheelbase and so i think 15 inch aluminum would be my choice to go for and by the way it takes about 11.5 seconds to go to 100 or 62 miles an hour, 100 kilometers, 62 miles an hour. But the electric is not really set on a 0 to 100 sprint. But on the very, you know, short sprints, there this car is really powerful directly from the traffic light. It, whew, like this, I can also show you that on the driving part. Really fun. To 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour, it's just one second slower than the turbo petrol engine, by the way. But again, this car is not about the accelerations to the higher speeds, but more in a short speed or the, the slow speeds inside the city, which you then can also, you know, have in a very fun way. And in the rear, I turn on those LED taillights now for you with the interesting structure right there, by the way. 
This is here always plastic, so not metal, but it's actually a good idea to have have those, you know, plastic fenders because if you have them, it's easier to replace them, for example. And the engine is always in the rear and it's always rear wheel driven. Yeah, pretty sports car like, right? The battery here is by the way, 17.6 kilowatt hours. And since you will have a consumption of about 15 to 16 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers, the range is something between, depending on the conditions, you know, AC on or off, very cold outside, normal temperature, between, let's say, 90 kilometers minimum up to 120 kilometers maximum something. So if you think about approximately 100 kilometers or 60, 70 miles, then you always know what your range basically is. Yeah, the petrol versions, they have maybe a range of 450 kilometers. That's a big advantage. So this car is really more for the short range distances. And I can already tell you so far about the charging infrastructure. This is really key to have one, for example, at home that you can regularly recharge. Here in Copenhagen, we'll also seek out uh, for some charging stations and tell you more about that. So by the way, the trunk, fold this one down, then you can put this one here up. And it's of course a little bit different in the coupe version. And well, this is really a practice test. You can see here, that's a cabin trolley, a backpack and a bigger trolley. So um, we played a little Tetris game and there's even the charging cable right there. So this one, for example, here is a small charging cable. Um, well, it is short. That's the disadvantage, but the advantage is that it can be fitted then quite well into the vehicle right there. So, uh, and remember, especially when you go for the electric version here, the EV, do not go for the additional sound system because there will be an additional speaker right there and you'll already lose some room due to the cable. Then if you have the speaker, you'll lose more room on the left side. You can demount it, of course. But then again, the question is, why should you go for this sound system then? By the way, if you demount those side roof rails for the convertible to make it a real convertible, you'll have then the storage area here in the rear part where you can then put the side, um, the side structure of the car. Now it will be a little bit higher. You'll lose some more trunk again, but I mean, considering it's such a small car, it is still well usable and for your daily groceries and stuff, it will also be just fine, I can tell you. By the way, this one here also fits with well 100 kilograms of weight would be so you can sit down here and have some picnic. And by the way, the torsional rigidity of the convertible is a little bit less, so they had to make the lower part then 15% stiffer from the chassis which then brings up the weight to about, you know, 50 kilograms more. That doesn't really matter about driving. So let me show you the interior. We've got fabric inserts here on the left side. This one here is then rather hard plastic. The interior is basically kept, kept simple, so to say. Small bottles you can put in right there. This one is the prime line, so it also comes with animal skin seats. I recommend you just to go for the base trim level with fabric seats or the passion trim. With the passion trim, you can get more extras, for example. If you want it completely animal skin free, you have to go for the base trim because you then can also get a base steering wheel. With the passion trim, you automatically get the animal skin on the steering wheel at least, but not on the seats. And you know, I usually kept the animal skin criticism rather short in our reviews since this one here is a sustainability episode. Let me just, you know, elaborate uh, it a little bit more because this is a really unsustainable part of the, of the car. More energy resources, uh, CO2 are being wasted with the leather production, tanning, you know, chemicals are being used. And of course, harm of animals and humans and the environment. So all three factors play a role there. We have, you know, did an extensive research also in this field. And if someone now comes again with the argument and saying like, 
oh, wait a minute, the animals or the cows especially are killed for the meat first. Well, if someone asks you, hey, you're getting, you're getting killed, but um, you can pick the reason why you're getting killed. In the one reason someone wants your skin and the other reason wants your flesh. Would you actually care? I don't think so. So that's about it. Uh, so definitely, I mean, when you want to build an EV that's also sustainable, don't go for the animal skin seats. Those are, you know, the, let's say, ethical reasons. But uh, I was buying leather seat cars myself before I knew better. And just for the very practical reasons, in summertime, you stick to the seats. They're getting hot and in winter times they're cold. So you need seat heating. And uh, with fabric seats, that's rather not such a big problem. So also, if you leave the ethical stuff aside, just for the practical reasons, I would always tell you, go for fabric seats. And actually, I mean, even better than Alcantara. So the climate uh, functions, the practical climate functions or the temperature functions are better for the fabric seat than also for Alcantara. Alcantara sometimes look fancier, by the way. And the steering wheel here itself, by the way, some interesting commands here. If you have the um, cruise control, you can set it on here, on the left side, activate it, and then set the speed right there with plus and minus. And this car is not equipped with the um, steering wheel column that is adjustable, but you can get this option. At this point, the option was not available for the EV yet, but you can click this option now, then you would be able to, you know, unplug it right here and then could move it up and down to, uh, to adjust it. That's very important. Uh, so uh, you can really adjust more to your driving position. You see here, in this case, my knees already get quite close. I can also move the seat up a little bit, but since I'm six foot one or one meter 86, I just keep it in the very lowest position. But interestingly, as a tall person, you have no problems with headroom here whatsoever. And also you sit quite upright, so I have more comfort in this 4.2 than in some of other small cars. By the way, if you are plugged into a charging station with the cable and then try to start the car or move it, it blocks electronically. That's a good thing. Just, you know, a good safety thing that you don't get, uh, you know, that they don't rip off the cable there. Very interesting. But what's not protected is the roof mechanism. So um, it's very interesting with the convertible. So you can do it like this also on the motorway, even at, you know, about 100 kilometers an hour, it still works. That's pretty cool and an advantage to a real convertible. But then the next step, so I can also put it a step further behind like this, but then in this case here, as we have the luggage all over the place, I would have to remove it first that, you know, it, it works. And there's no electric warning as for this part. You have to watch it yourself. And then when you have the second step lowered, we can also take out the side bolsters. So now we uncluttered the trunk. So that's the second step. And I do recommend the second step. There's, by the way, also a wind deflector available for here, but you don't really need it because when you go lower down here, the second step, it's better for the, let's say, wind features. So it's less noisy in the interior if you have lowered it down. Pretty interesting aspect. And then you actually need some practice. So first of all, you can open this cover here first that you can store it. And this is now a special practice for me because I'm one-handed <laughs> with a microphone that you can hear me better. It's also, you know, quite windy here today, very rainy as well. Um, so we have better sound quality for you with the bigger microphone. So I, I can do all my do is with one hand here, pretty pretty cool. You need some practice. This is the left one. So you put this one here on the upper part like this. It says here left and left. And you can see this small knob right there. This small knob here you have to press it back twice. And when you've done that then you can also lift the part here up like this. And I mean it comes handier, it comes a little bit easier by time, but then if you think about in everyday driving life, sometimes then you think, hmm, come on, let's just open the top part and forget about the second step that is then possible. So, I, you know, in our long-term endurance test, I do this when it's really, really nice weather and now 
I'm driving open top the whole day. You see, you can close it here again then. That's possible. But it goes a little bit higher. So, but when I'm not sure what I'm doing at the day, or maybe I have to go from A to B to C, then I just leave it as it is and get the side, the, the side parts here just in place. It really depends on, you know. It does make a difference. So in this way, when you then also lower the windows maybe, you have a real convertible feeling. When they are still installed, you have some kind of convertible feeling. Not 100%, but let's say 90%. And in most cases, as my experience now show, you leave them in place and say, I'm fine with 90% convertible feeling. Because it's still cool and you're still very flexible with this car. You have a very nice city convertible. And the combination of having a convertible and electric vehicle is fantastic, I can tell you. So about this interior overview, the car is of course fun. You can also get this part, for example, in orange. Um, you can also have a white setup here for the interior, for example, then everything which is here in high glossy black is then in, in white, which looks brighter and more fun. But at the same time, of course, this is the more subtle way and maybe on the long term run. So on the short term run, I would probably pick the white setup here for every, everything, but maybe it looks better on the long term run with the black run. I'm, you know, I have mixed feelings about this. I'm not quite sure, but both look fun for sure. So different colors available. This is here the um, electric uh, gauge with power charge, you, you know, capacity of the battery you have and also the recuperation. But I can tell you this car does not recuperate that much. You can also see it. Um, it's more set to let you roll everything. If you want to recuperate a little bit more, you can use this eco button here. Then the car recuperates more. So when you leave the throttle, it reduces the speed a little bit more and gains back the um, gains back the energy. But then again, you have to press it every time again after you've started the vehicle. I would have wished a function where you could maybe choose that or let's say have a bigger recuperation in general and also that this eco mode is activated all the time. So I'm always basically driving with it but, but maybe a little bit annoyed that I have to press it all the time all over the place again. Also annoying, you have to use the standard key here. There's no keyless, uh, keyless entry available. You have to open the car and then always put it right in here. Um, that could also be you know, a little bit more cozy to use. Standard handbrake here still. That is um, one of the features. Automatic gearbox here for the electric motor. That's for sure. There's also um, you know, this dual clutch transmission available for the petrol engine, by the way. Here you can open the roof. In the front, well, those cup holes are quite shallow. They don't really work with bigger bottles. That's something that is missing. Then purse or smartphone can be placed here. But if you want to charge then your phone, you have the cable hanging from here all the way to here to the USB socket. Oh, my cup holder right there. So that's not the best place for the USB socket because where you do you want to put your smartphone right here? Hmm. But I would recommend you then, for example, here there's an additional armrest available. Pick this option here and then there would be an armrest right here. Hey, my arm is, or my hand is playing the armrest now. Like, hello, I'm the armrest. Then it would open like this and you could, for example, put your smartphone right here and then charge it here with a USB port. This car is also equipped with a GPS system, but it's so super expensive for a system that software is basically absolute rubbish. So the only cool thing is that you then here have an integrated rear view camera. There we go. It doesn't have the best resolution, but and I mean, I know it's a short car, you don't need it, but especially for the convertible, when you're driving with open top, you don't see so much in the rear. And this car here, I mean, you're searching for parking spots, spots which are actually no parking spots at all. So it is useful to have this rear view camera that you can really park in to a very, very close way. It is definitely useful to have it, but then again, you have to go for this infotainment system, couple of thousand euros extra. Um, then you can add the rear view camera. It's not included even for I think about 300 euros more as another extra and wow, come on. And you have to pick the passion trim at least that you're only able 
to get the infotainment system. So the extra price policy, you can easily get then a smart for two for about 30,000 euros. And wow, that's really expensive for such a vehicle. So maybe you could also go with a third party rear view camera if you want one. There's those that you can put on the rear view mirror, for example. And you just need someone to install it for you if you if you cannot do it so far yourself or you're just saying you know you go with the pdc the park distance control this this beeping sound maybe so this is you know a topic on its own and wow jonas gets hit by the door now because of the wind and again the software here is very complicated to pick your source of music bluetooth connection is available Apple CarPlay or Android Auto is not available. The GPS, I mean, gets you to destination, but a lot of times it has long delay and also the visualization is not that good. And, you know, look at this. I just swipe with my finger in there and then some stuff like this happens. So this is of the one of the worst software you can get. They should update it for sure. And finally with the instruments this is also very interesting because this digital instrument gauge right there is also an option well you don't have to have it but it's good to have it for sure and then you can for example also check the um, this one is the most relevant now here uh, on the last thousand kilometers 15 kilowatt hours per one kilometers so it's between 15 and 16 kilowatt hours per one kilometers for a small car that's quite a lot already I think with Bigger electric vehicles like you know Tesla and some, we have about like 25 kilowatt hours per one kilometers, maybe sometimes a little, little bit less. I think this car should consume also less. Then again, as a petrol engine, it's also not really fuel saving. So to me, this car does totally make sense as an electric vehicle. Again, if you have a charging infrastructure also at home. So one of the really genius things here with this car is you can get anywhere. And I mean, I would never think of going with a normal passenger car through those two barriers here. And as you can see, I don't even have to flip the mirrors. So <laughs> that's just like this. That it's really so cool. And of course, the incredible turning circle of this vehicle. I mean, look at this now. Then maybe back again, turn the wheel other way around. And it almost feels like you would be uh, moving, you know, well, uh, you know, where we're just being on the, on the same stage. And with any other vehicle, I would have so much hassle going around here. And just like this, it almost feels like the car has no turning circle at all. And so often that you, you know, find any parking spots something which are no parking spots at all and this car makes them some you know there are always different possibilities to charge and here near the Copenhagen harbor area it was actually quite easy because there are several stations right here and in this case from here I have this token and I just you know had to plug in the cable hold the token and then it starts charging of course the question is I mean how many cars do you want to carry with you then there are also several services, for example, you know, plug serving, Jaguar Land Rover will be using that for the iPace, for example. And also Daimler is offering a special card where they combine different services. But the question is always, are all stations then included? So you really have to pick your favorite services for your favorite stations if you're not, you know, um, registered with a special network or something. So there are a lot of possibilities, but you really have to do the research for each single brand. Which card do you need for the stations in your proximity? We are in the car and you hear the, the ventilation going. And by the way, if you have AC on and now full power on the ventilation, no, that's, that's full power now. The range drops to four, 84 kilometers. And if I, Turn the heating off, it pops up to 120 kilometers. So that's how you can see how much difference it does make when you have like the heating or the AC on or off. It also does make a big difference in petrol cars for sure. Um, you know, we had that recently also in, in summertime when it was really hot, it was making a big difference. So something about like one and a half liters on one kilometers. That's of course really significant, 
but then even more significant for an electric vehicle, a lot of bicycle traffic in Copenhagen. I mean, even with this weather, I mean, that's really, come on, let's, let's praise the Danish for being on their bikes, even in such harsh weather conditions. That's really cool. So, and now we start our Thomas is driving the lounge here with the Smart EV or the Smart EQ is the brand right now. And I mean, I've driven the Smart before, so it's nothing and you know entirely new to me. And I was always thinking, now would I ever buy such a vehicle? Because I mean, other cars, like the bigger ones, they're clearly more comfortable and stuff. But then again, the more you drive this car, the more you realize how genius it actually is. So, you know, when you're especially struck in traffic, sometimes you can, oh, there's a BMW i3. I mean, you, you do like some, some squeezing in situations, you know? Sometimes, you know, at the intersection, there's maybe just little space and you go around like this in S form and just continue um, right, right straight again. And you're also very relaxed also when you have some very narrow traffic situations with some very big cars. You say, oh, you know, I got great comfort on the motorway. But then again, if you're in a narrow, narrow city traffic, it's like, oh, does that fit with the mirrors? And does this work? And why do I find the parking spot? And wow, I can't turn right here and that's not possible. And, with this car, you're always really relaxed doing that. So that's actually no problem at all. And of course, you can see it also here in the traffic, how little traffic space I am actually taking away. And if everyone would be driving such a small car here, you know, this whole row here, this queuing up in the city would actually be significantly reduced. So this car makes perfect sense for the city and then you know that um, that the ride is maybe a little bit bumpier at times. That's definitely the case with such a short wheelbase. I mean, it's not so bad then um, inside the city. Of course, if you're driving a little bit faster, that's, you know, can definitely be more comfortable with those bigger vehicles. But then in the city, you also appreciate the um, sometimes stiff suspension it's because also really fun to ride. And here, especially in this traffic queue, um, so, you know, it's 4.30, so typical time where the Copenhagen traffic gets worth. So, we're driving electric. I'm not boosting anything into the air at the moment here locally. Of course, if you take the production into account, the EVs don't grow on trees. <laughs> but then again, standing here in traffic, and for example, behind me, I hear this diesel from the a light commercial vehicle running in there behind us and that's making noise and also you know, emissions from the exhaust. But here at the moment, it's actually totally fine. So this makes sense also if you think about you know a taxi queue that is proceeding one by one, for example. So if everyone would have the electric vehicles here, especially now for inner city driving, that would totally make sense. Then you always had the discussion about the EVs in general, about the batteries, because you need those, um, you know, very rare resources to build the batteries, lithium, of course, and also cobalt. And there are also production ethical issues about this, you know, a lot of water use, for example, the lithium uh, in Chile, then also some illegal uh, cobalt mines, for example, in, in, in Central Africa, where people also um, you know, really suffer and stuff. That's, you know, also a lot of bad things happening there. That's for sure. Um, so at the moment, I think we should concentrate on, you know, getting cleaner batteries. So batteries that maybe they are already in development that maybe, for example, do not need cobalt. They just have the lithium problem. Or maybe um, people thought that the new Tesla Model 3 use obviously less lithium per cell than the other EVs before. So those uh, developments really help the EVs to get also sustainable in a whole production circle sense. And of course, the more you drive an EV, the more sustainable it gets over time then, comparing to the 
classic combustion engine. You can also argue that the ones with the smaller batteries are more sustainable because again less materials and resources are being used for that. If you think about this very car for example then I think that does make sense in a way because you know you don't need such a huge range with this small city car. Usually you need it and use it in the city and then when you go home for example you plug it in again even a normal household plug will be just fine because the battery is not so big. With the wall box it takes charging of about three to maximum six hours, something like that. And um, usually, I mean, if you read it from zero to 100 um, percent of the, of the whole battery. But my experience is now when I maybe like it about 20 percent, I have it to 80 percent in about, you know, 30 to 40 minutes or so and that's a realistic figure and again you usually don't deplete this EV you plug it in again when you stop somewhere and, and that's it and to me I would definitely go for it if I would have the charging infrastructure at home but since the other co-owners of my basement garage are blocking it are saying electric mobility is devil's work I have no chance to do it so that's again the problem and to me the core problem of electric mobility it's not the price it's not the range it's the infrastructure that's you know how i think the convertible by the way you hear it maybe also is a little bit louder than the coupe because of the soft top and there is some dampening here but i mean there are surely you know some more elaborate damp dampenings and of course the great thing is always i can always open the roof I mean, today is really bad weather, it's not so good, but um, I mean, you can always leave light inside, it's so great. You can always enjoy it, even in winter times. Just not maybe when it's raining, then it's not so cool, but I just love to have it. So when I would go for the 4.2, I would definitely pick the convertible. And as I said earlier, you don't always have to uh, demount um, the side bars right there. You'll also just find you have a good convertible feeling if you open it like this. That's also fine. And you stay flexible then because if you have demounted them, you cannot close the roof again. But in this case, I see, oh, it's starting to rain. Just close it again. Oh, on the motorway, you, you, you feel like, oh, I'm getting too fast driving or so. Mm -hmm. Then you just close it again and have a little bit more calmness in the ride. Yeah, some people are obviously, you know, very annoyed already. But with a small car here, you can also stay pretty calm. Again, this upright seating position is also quite cool. And you know that you're always flexible to move around or maybe, you know, find an, a next gap here and there. And I think being stuck in traffic is a central experience really with this vehicle. And as you have this, this EV boost, so you're also very fast if you want to change lanes or something or you see traffic light is you know about to jump in 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 whatever direction and you can always get that on and yeah there we go so the competition in front of us now of course they have um two more spots to sit on um also a very interesting vehicle by the way as we um uh, you know also also will talk about supply chains BMW with the i3, they actually at the moment the only manufacturer who say we have the complete supply chain in a you know in a transparent way. We can show you that we can show you where every resource is coming from, but they are just doing that for the i3 as a model project. What means they have no clue what's happening with the other things, and if you ask them, they always have those statements like. Due to competition reasons, we do not reveal the sources of our suppliers. And that's what every not only BMW, every manufacturer says that. And I think what they're doing with the i3, this should become common with every car, that you have a look at the whole supply chain and really know where your stuff is coming from. Because sometimes, you know, it's like product A is being sold by someone, then sold by someone again, then another wholesale dealer or whatever, and then at the end of the day, the manufacturer has no clue what's happening. No. I think this has to change big time. This is also one of the parts to make the whole industry more sustainable. 
So finally we're getting somewhere and by the way when I have this eco mode activated there's a small recuperation but again the recuperation is not really strong. So I recommend to use the eco mode it does bring you more range because when you're driving here in the city you usually have situations where you want to reduce the speed again as soon as you lift the foot off your throttle. That's happening quite frequently. So use the eco mode. Yes, we have to, have to activate it each time again, but using it is really effective, it is worthwhile. And somehow it's also better and safer that the car is slowing down a little bit when you leave the throttle. I made the experience also when we were driving, for example, the, the, the Teslas and um, you really can get used to it that you have a strong recuperation. So I would have wished that they have also a stronger recuperation mode built in this vehicle. I'm not exactly sure why they haven't done it. Um, one of the reasons might be it's a small car, you cannot recuperate so much energy maybe. Maybe the energy, the, the battery would also, we you know, become maybe too full or something, I don't know. Or maybe just the whole recuperation technology here was not that elaborate at this, at this um, you know, at this point of time, for example. So now we'll browse through Copenhagen just a little bit and double here, lane change is so fun with this car. It feels like a go-kart, it's so fast, the steering is really direct, it's really super fun to drive. So you don't have to say, oh, you go for a very small, maybe environmental friendly car or something, then you lose your driving fun. It's actually the other way around. And, um, you know, especially when I had like situations where I have different vehicles available to pick and then we say, oh, let's go to, you know, to this and this city and we have a meeting here and there and which car are we actually going for? And even if there was a motorway included and I think, wait a minute, do I pick the Mercedes GLS because it's such a comfortable ride, but then Hmm, at my final destination, there's no way I could ever find a parking spot right there with a big vehicle. Let's go with the Smart 4 too. You know, we're maybe a little bit less comfort on going there. But then again, I know I can basically park in front of the door almost everywhere. Tesla Model X in red, in red right there. Um, so this has been a major factor and you know the more I've been driving this car also in our uh, long time test that was also you know the the reason for our long time test we really wanted to find out first of all what about the electric mobility and the practicability in everyday driving life and second this very small car especially here this for two does it really suit you know the, um, the you know, a, a modern car driver's lifestyle and it, it totally does. I, I was really surprised myself because I really also enjoy driving bigger cars that are also very comfortable, maybe also SUVs and stuff. But this car is really, really amazing. I can, I can just stress it again. And I wouldn't ever, you know, ever have thought that, that I speak so extremely positive about the car. I knew already that the concept was very clever to have such a small vehicle available as well. But it's really, you have so many moments where you say like, this is so cool now, you know? And one of that is for sure the driving fun. The other one is that you always find a spot maybe where you can park the car. And so it relieves stress. This is, I think, a, a big point. Um, or for example, I was driving it with, um, with the car to go. So with the car sharing service in Berlin. And I was going into this um, basement garage where it was so narrow and when I was maybe there with a with a Mercedes E-Class or something, I think it was just straight right here. Um, so this again also a very easy exercise. So when I was there like with a bigger car, I think, oh, do I damage the rims here and there? Does it really fit left and right? And here again, it's so you know, it again absolutely no problem you know you will basically fit in everywhere. That's definitely a really cool experience. I also want to show you the acceleration because um, from time to time I also made fun out of sports car drivers. Um, when you maybe stay in a traffic light, there's maybe a dual lane and then there's a Porsche next to you and you hammer the throttle here. And I think, you know, like on a zero to 40 kilometers or something, I mean, that's almost the whole acceleration in the city. 
you really beat the sports car drivers to the line. That's so... <laughs> and then they look like that. What's going on here? <laughs> this is really a lot of fun, I can tell you. Um, so you can do so much fun things also with, with the car. Um, it is also fast as a petrol car, yes, but the electric vehicle as the torque is already there. So there's no classic power curve with an electric vehicle. It's either on or off, it's like zero or one. Of course, you can, you know, um, finally tune it with the, with the throttle in general, but there's no power curve. So I can access all the power I have instantaneously. That's also why it is so much fun still. And of course, the silence, you know, when you're, when you're driving, especially at lower speeds, and also in combination with the convertible, we had it once in a short test, but now as I was also testing it for, for a longer time, this combination of convertible and electric ride is so genius, again, it's so much fun. It's like driving a bicycle with about, you know, 70 kilometers an hour, that's still possible. You get to know more feelings from the surrounding, maybe more, more smells, even you don't smell yourself from the exhaust. You hear more, you, you're more just, you know, aware of, of what's happening. And that's really a very cool thing. So I wonder that it hasn't been, you know, done in a more frequent way before or so. Um, but it's definitely a combination I would always recommend. It's something very special. It's, to me, mm, forming some kind of own car genre, this combination of, of cabriolet and electric vehicle. So now, by the way, when I'm going off the throttle, just a little recuperation, even in the eco mode. So again, not really that strong. If you can, by the way, also just tip this turning indicator just a little bit. Um, but then again, you really have to, you know, have good feeling for that. That's possible. Most of the time, then you just hammer it in completely that it works. So here, for example, when I'm going at 25, then I just hammer the throttle. Plop, 50. So 54 it was already. That's really cool. That's a very sporty acceleration. Now also good practice here with those cobblestones. I mean, it's quite okay, but you feel that the suspension is getting rough at times. Mm, so I do recommend to stick with those 15 inch rims. If you go with the 16 inch aluminum rims, the ride get, you know, gets maybe a little bit rougher. Also, there's this sports package available which then again sets the car a little bit lower and stiffens the suspension. So I would also not go for this one. I would stay with a standard suspension and then 15-inch aluminum rims. That's, I think, the most comfortable setup you can have. And at the same time, it already looks good from the outside. Driving on the motorway, by the way, is of course possible, yes. Mm, you know, a comfortable speed is about 100 still drive open by the way um, 120 maximum for example but anything above that no matter if petrol or EV smart now mm, everything above that if you get into very high speeds it's not really that comfortable so um, I would rather yeah that's always a lot, really dangerous here especially when it's rainy you don't see so much in the side mirrors Oh, look, no, I think that's what the last, yeah. yeah, so last bicycle right here. But again, so great that they have so much bicycle traffic here. And, you know, that's also, you know, about talking about sustainability, one thing you can do, um, it's not about we all lead perfect lives, but, you know, very short ways, maybe just go by foot or then next one, take the bike. And then we think, ah, you know, this, this brings me really a lot of comfort when I go with the car there. I mean, why not, you know? But that you really adapt um, the length of your rides and maybe choose to bike a little bit more often. I mean, that's already a start for sure. And I also try to do that. So everything which is in my close proximity, I'm driving also with a bicycle every day, basically. Um, and then if you, you know, leave city boundaries, I take the car. And when it's like mid-range, I try to take the 
train then instead of the plane for, for you know, inner German travel, for example. And then when it's really a, a longer distance, then I take the plane. And you know, this is probably you know, my biggest uh, CO2 footprint with the, uh, with the flights. Um, if I wouldn't do that, I couldn't do my job at the moment. That's, that's just how it is. And I know it's not pretty, you know, the, uh, the frequent flights I take. Um, but at the moment, that's just a situation, um, you know, how it is for me. And I, I cannot really change it. But other things where, where I can change something, they can, for example, be active. And I think that's, that's also an approach. Again, um, no one is obliged to, to be super perfect or something, but, you know, try to make your contribution. So now we're getting out the traffic a little bit, that we move the car around a little bit more freely. And again, just doing a small slalom ride here and there is so much fun with this vehicle. And of course, a very cool thing is also that you can basically make your own U-turn just um, you know, inside the street. So there's, there's, you know, there's a line that goes through here, but if I would theoretically be able to, you know, just go back here and it would be allowed here, it would work. They would just, you know, turn the steering wheel all the way and I could drive exactly the next lane back again. This would work, no problem. Couldn't do that with a normal wheelbase car, like here, situations like those. Just a steel left, just a little bit, you're free to go again. So I also took, you know, some, some, some time, te time tests and stuff, and you are really faster with this car inside the city because you sometimes don't have to wait uh, so long and just get through or don't have to check left and right so much that you don't damage your own car. So um, this is also a very, very interesting finding here for sure. So I want to show you some more free driving and we have the red traffic light and we have free way to go and I will just do an acceleration now from 0 to 60. Let's see how that goes. Pretty interesting to see that acceleration. Then we also drive a little bit faster and also, you know, not really being stuck in traffic and it's also a very interesting perspective for sure. By the way, if you don't really need the heating, we usually turn the heating off now. That's it. And like with a sports car, <laughs> everyone behind me is being stuck. Of course, that's also not good for the energy consumption, but it's also a lot of fun, definitely, to do that in this, in this, in this vehicle. Really cool. Um, yeah, about the heating. So if you turn the heating off, and I mean, now Jonas and me, we're sitting here in this tiny car, and we're pretty hot guys, you know. So, <laughs> therefore, we're producing so much heat ourselves, and that's actually quite okay then. But then again, if you're driving in cold winter times and probably even alone in the car, or when it's wet outside, it you have this humidity on the inside, you, you do need the AC. And again, the range drops massively then. So that's a big problem. And again, it's not a car for the, you know, overland trips or something still we want to show you something about it here so now we're about 90 kilometers an hour and it gets a little bit now we're at 90 kilometers an hour so almost 60 miles and it does get significantly loud in here so it's even if you have the petrol engine it's um, not the real strength of the vehicle still it's still more silent in the EQ in the electric version than you would be having it in a petrol version. Of course, the higher you go in the speed levels, the less difference it will actually make. Because when you hear something from the outside, it's already about 25 kilometers an hour, and then above that, that it can be you know, louder actually just from, from the tire noise. Um, it obviously depends, of course, on the vehicles, so the very big vehicles can like 25 kilometers, especially trucks and so, and the passenger cars, 
a little bit, maybe 40, 50, it always depends on, of course. But then again, if you sit on the inside, talked about also in another video already, you sometimes drive with the open top here in about 70 kilometers an hour and still have the feeling it's more silent. But then again, if you have a really high speed, like on a motorway, then the differences are not that high anymore. Um, so now about 110 kilometers, I can also set the cruise control. So that's helpful also to keep up a good range. Set the cruise control, then we're at the steady speed. It would be better if we, I would set the cruise control to 90 or so, but you know, our trip will be 60 kilometers now and we have 120 kilometers of range, it says. And I mean, if, as long as I don't turn on the heating, we have plenty of kilometers left in that range for sure. So, and I mean, if you're using it every day in the city, that's really fine. But then again, if you have a longer commuting trip, can get close with the range. That's then the disadvantage of having the very small battery. The advantage is again to you know, not harm the environment that much with battery production because it's a smaller battery, less cells and so on. And of course, the bigger the battery, the higher the price is as well. And if you would think that this car would have a bigger battery, it would get super, super expensive. I mean, even at those speeds, we could also open the roof. I'm not sure, sure I want to do it with 100, but um, I mean, now that they're about 90 or something, you can still do that. So that's possible, you know, that's um, quite cool actually. Man. Of course, it gets also quite loud in here, but then again, if it's warm enough, and you, for example, you are driving then with a second level down, again, it's a road trip this time, so we have our luggage in there again, so we cannot lower to the second level. If we would have the second level, it would also create less wind noises again. So if we caught some wind noise now, sorry for that, again, the second level of the roof would be better against the wind noises. And it's also not too warm today, actually. So by the way, um, is there any power left when you're, for example, now at 90 and go to 110 again? Let's try that. There we go. <laughs> so there is still something happening, yes. Now in the higher speed areas, it's where the turbo engine especially is quicker. But if you compare it to the naturally aspirated smaller engines here with the Smart for 2, then the EV is definitely stronger in, in every respect for sure. Um, we cannot get it to maximum speed here today because of uh, Swedish regulations on the motorway. So we're going to this maximum right here. I think it's also quite fine to you know, just experience that. So we have um, the free running motorway now. Also had a lot of city experience, maybe as the last test here at higher speeds. See, the car remains relatively stable. That's again because the suspension is very stiff, but the car won't flip over or something due to the short wheelbase. So considering it's a very short car, it feels safe and stable also at higher speeds. It's just the wind noises that are a little bit annoying. That's also the reason why I wouldn't recommend it really as a you know, regular motorway car. So now we have unlimited motorway speed and what was it again in Sweden? Was it 110 anyway or was it was it faster? Better be safe and stay with the speed, right? <laughs> because the fees in Sweden, if you do something wrong, quite high. I promised you also to show you some different kinds of mobility besides driving a car and here in Copenhagen it's also about the, let's call it water mobility. And the company of GoBoat, they are using boats, 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 <laughs> electric boats, you can see them right there. And they are basically solar powered, so they have a battery inside. And then on the roof of the rental building, so to say, they have a solar power plant and they are then supplying the power, not for all, but for most of the boats. And then you can sail around 10 hours with a full charge without any fumes or whatsoever. And if you guys know, you know, some motorboats, 
they don't smell that good. Um, but here, of course, no problem, especially if you go through the small canals in the city and just explore it. I think also a good way to make a more sustainable experience in a different kind of mobility. And now we're joined by Casper from GoBoat. Fort and got it. <laughs> they all got. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, actually, you could explain us what is actually the, the more sustainable way for this boat rent. Why wouldn't you just use the, you know, the normal petrol ones? Uh, there's several reasons to that. I think uh, the most important one is that uh, we believe that there's in the maritime universe there's a so, sort of uh, respect and uh, some special values that uh, we would like to reflect in our business. So, uh, so it's very important for us that people who has maybe never tried sailing before, even before they enter the experience and go out sailing, they have uh, been brought in a sort of respectful uh, mind to it. So, uh, so that's why we've chosen to make everything as sustainable as possible. For example, you also have the lift, the uplift of the boat, also with you know recycled plastic bottles. Yes. So this also belongs to the concept then. That's just a part of it, I think, and, the, and the, yeah, that's one part, and the table uh, we use, the wood, uh, uh, the electricity uh, that provides, you know, uh, the, the, the power for the batteries are sust uh, sustainable. So everything we do, we aim to keep it sustainable whenever possible. So you know, critics often say, yeah, okay, maybe it's sustainable, good for the environment, but then it costs you money, you know, it's not really economical, but can you also combine both ways? Definitely. Uh, I would say uh, in, uh, our business is a very good uh, business case in that way. It's if we'd chosen uh, to, 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 to use gasoline engines, uh, we would have, been, have had much more expenses every year. We save a lot of money every year uh, by using electricity. So that's a brilliant example on, on how sustainability is better. So that's great. Yeah. Mal tak for that. Pleasure. And now we've moved to a way bigger ship. We are on the Chugo Bar. And actually here between Helsingør and Helsingborg, so between Denmark and Sweden, they have now two ships that are running all battery electric. They still have a backup diesel generator on board, just you know, for emergency cases, and they are still in the testing phase. But soon, two ferries here between Denmark and Sweden, they will run all day, all night, 24 hours a day, on battery electric power and whereas you can charge for example a smart EQ with an optional 22 kilowatt charger recommend you to take that one those ships here are charging on DC so on direct current with 10 megawatts because the batteries are of course way larger over 4000 kilowatt hours is the capacity of the battery and when as soon as we reach the port now soon again they have some robotic arms and they plug in actually and then they recharge the ship and they always try to keep the battery capacity between 40 and 60 percent something also recommended by the way for cars and also for smartphones never totally deplete them and never charge them totally up to 100 percent that's good for the whole battery cycle and it's very interesting that here on the top of the ship they have put all the, diff the different batteries. It's overall 250 tons of batteries that are placed right here. Large stacks, very interesting to see how they have this, you know, like those whole rooms for the batteries. Next also to the power generators. And this really adds a new dimension to the ship. And they're pretty excited actually also about the project. And they're also taking the energy here from the offshore windmills close by. There's a huge windmill park. Our viewers from Denmark will know that. And sometimes, you know, the wind is blowing that hard that you can give this energy for very cheap, you know, especially also when you're running at night. And this one here is a service. It's also running at night. And it's very interesting because they commute about 20 minutes and then they charge again about 10 minutes on each port side. So you can really use all the renewable energies here as well. Pretty useful solution. 
And the captain of this ship is Jürgen Damgor, and I want to know why are you actually doing this? Are you have you know some some personal interest in changing to the battery electric? Well, uh, in fact, not. Uh, I've just been in a very lucky position to be uh, captain aboard this ship while this uh, project is uh, is uh, decided, and we're doing this project. And uh, I'm very pleased. Uh, I feel my for myself a little bit lucky. So, <laughs> so what does it change for you as a captain when you? driving the ship? Well, in fact, uh, it doesn't mean that much to the navigators. Um, the biggest change is that when you're sitting in battery power, you have all the power uh, uh, right away. When you're sitting in, 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 um, in diesel generators, uh, there's a small delay because they have to build up power, but uh, with batteries you have the power right away. So that's uh, the biggest uh, difference. So, and the navigators, my colleagues, they, they like it. It's a little bit like with the cars as well. You it have is. the, the it is. instant it talk, yeah. It is. In fact, it's, uh, it's like a driven uh, battery, driven uh, car. You, you have the power right away. And of course, the question is, does it pay off also money-wise on the long-term run? Do you know that yet? Well, it's hard to say because uh, that means that you have to be able to, uh, to foresee the, the prices of oil in the future. And that is almost impossible. So, no, uh, no I, don't, I don't know that. So. <laughs> okay, we will see. We'll keep you up. Thank okay. you so much. Okay, you're welcome. They are drawing in Kong of Denmark. So, the kings of this country. And now we arrived in Helsingborg. <laughs> welcome to Sverige. So welcome to Sweden. And well, the funny thing is you have to find a charging station because we have about 40 kilometers of capacity left or 40 kilometers of range. And well, we found one here close to the city center. That's of course pretty cool, but we had to scroll through different apps of the, you know, of the services to get the proper one. So it was not convenient to find one. Well, here finally we did. Um, you see, we are using those short cables, by the way. It's also the 4.4 the electric also available. Um, so I'm always parking, you know, with the rear next to the charging station. With the 4.2 is actually no problem. I would really recommend a short cable in this case because you can always turn the car. With a bigger electric vehicle, you rather need the longer cables because you're not always able to move around that freely. Then maybe you have to park in forward or something and it's still possible to get the cable around. Of course, all the electric vehicles have the charging plugs at a different point as well. But here in the rear right for that one, and then we could use a charging card. But still, we also carry different charging cards with us. So, you know, my experience also when I'm doing it in Germany with the charging stations, sometimes it's nice to have one, but I would never solely rely on that. So my verdict here from this praxis or practical test is also have a charging point at home. Then the EVs are absolutely fine. If not, I would rather stick with the normal combustion engines. So you know that on Autogrufu we usually also feature new car interiors, maybe also with a more sustainable concept, also with plant-based materials. But there are of course other, also other fields and regions where you can use sustainable materials, for example, for public interiors. And Johan Berin is the founder of this company in here. It's called Green Furniture Concept in Malmö in Sweden. And what you can see here, for example, this is basically a public bench. Maybe you have already seen one, but didn't really know where it came from. So why is it so special? Well, we use natural materials that grow into the public interior, um, really sourced from here locally. Uh, we plant trees for every uh, part of, of a bench sold here locally for the furniture production. Um, and if you can make a really good product, thought from the start, uh, durable, uh, of natural material that can last for long, um, you're good at it sustainably wise. And, and, and we've found a concept here where we actually can have very long warranty and, and it's very easy to maintain in good shape, um, which is also a sustainable factor. Um, 
So, so keeping a nice place over time with natural materials. So it's actually quite cozy to sit on, and for example, you can get it here. You like in a, you know in a pure wood scheme, but as you could see over there, also you know with a little bit more color. And I found the concept quite interesting that you say. Um, it's not only sustainable because it's sustainable, but it should be better at the same time than the normal conventional product. And also, you know, looking at the whole, you know, at the whole supply chain that, for example, less chemicals are being used for anything you you actually yeah. do. And yeah. and also, heard you are using German wood at the moment, right? <laughs> yeah, this German German beech and and, and oak. Uh, and and as you say, um, you wouldn't buy a, an ugly shirt just because it's sustainable. It it has to be better. It has to be better looking. It has to be more functional and sustainable. And, and then it will be a success. But but you can't really make a sustainable product and believe people will buy it just because it's sustainable. So so I think that's a that's a trick you got to get over. And and uh, you got to have that in mind designing sustainable things overall. Yeah, I also think I mean our goal should be to do something which is like sustainable and maybe lo combining luxury and sustainability and also the functionality. You can also charge your phone, by the way, and at this bench, just right over there at the edge. And um, this, I think, also where you know the trend is going on that those are benches not only for sitting, but also for, for more purposes. Absolutely. You, 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 don't, you don't only make a seat, you make a place, an interior place. It should be appealing. It should be of natural material. It will be nice. Of organic shapes, it will be nice. And pe people, passengers, will be satisfied and and you know that's that's nice for you and me uh, visiting the place but it's also nice for for the owner of the place the business at the place and and the satisfaction of of travelers uh, which is very important now and it's really there is a possibility people don't usually think about it i think but there is a possibility of doing more than just adding seats and they also have another interesting product just right over there they use you know, the real trees but then they have those sound dampers on there. Uh, it, it was felt, was it? It's, this is wool felt, yes. Uh, so it's whole 100% natural materials. Uh, and it gives a nice sphere to the area, both acoustically and visually. And a place to gather around. We can sit here in the shade of the tree uh, for large places indoors. So it really you know, brings the sound volume down. And um, I mean, maybe you've seen the, the stuff now. And maybe you know, at your airport, at the train station, you will discover that one. You know, we also have a lot of views from, from Sweden, for example. So where can you find it? You know, in, in which places? Uh, so we're, we're in Munich airport. We're in uh, Potsdam. We're in uh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, some seven, eight uh, uh, railway stations around Germany, Switzerland. Uh, and Stockholm uh, railway station. Stockholm railway station, absolutely. We do. Uh, we have done most of the big uh, railway stations here in Sweden. Uh, in France, we're airports of of, of uh, Australia and and United States. Uh, Quito's in Ecuador, even. Cool. Thank you so much for the insight, and uh, you know, a good example of how you know small ideas can actually also become big and be sustainable at the same time. We have just parked our Smart EQ electric vehicle in a big parking garage there, which is actually very interestingly constructed, but actually it's also a public building where people actually live and on the outside it looks way different with a lot of green. And Bo Christiansen is an architect here, also had to do something with the project here and also has visions for the whole city of Copenhagen because you can see it in the background, it's just about 10 minutes train ride away from here and that's also the reason for the city of Orstel. This one here is basically a satellite city, but it had also a whole vision to the whole project. So what was the idea of Orsted? Well, many scopes to Orsted, that's for sure. First of all, back then when it started uh, to be planned, Copenhagen was near bankruptcy and something serious had to be done. Uh, Two-fold scope. Uh, this was a great chance to reintroduce a tram system or a metro system. We just heard the, uh, the tram, the driver without drivers uh, passing by, uh, to introduce that out here as the backbone of this new international business district. But you also have about 20% living homes here, which are, of course, you know, always the most interesting, basically. And um, I mean, it's not too much so it has this office focus but you also have you know we've seen 
very nice park, for example, with a, with a soccer field, for example, where people can also spend time outside because, you know, that's what you've also done with, with Copenhagen to revive the inner city, to make it car free in this case, that there are public spaces because you always need those public spaces for a city to, you know, to, to live actually. And um, how could you implement this also here and also make living and working more sustainable? Well, first of all, I think the, the good fortune out here is that it's uh, built within a green lung of Copenhagen. It's a former military uh, area which was condemned from the sea after the Second World War. So the area was opened up for the public and accepted uh, to uh, develop the Ørsta uh, in with its four neighborhoods. So in a way, uh, that uh, from the very uh, first day brought it into kind of the maybe an ideal scope, at least for some, or I would say maybe as a future kind of uh, version of suburbia uh, with a with a um, urban focus. So it's actually best of uh, two. It means literally a, uh, a young family with children can live here without a car if they choose so. They would rather have their second home in uh, south of Sweden maybe or somewhere at the beaches in Denmark and finding alternative ways of getting there. But second homes they could then afford when not having a daily car on a Uh, I mean, a car on a daily base with based on 140% luxury tax, then they can take the metro back and forth uh, to work uh, and, and, and studies. So when it comes to accessibility of the green uh, living and, and recreational living, uh, there's an abundance of that then. Uh, the green lung is huge <laughs> surrounding this area and the greenery is always in between, like the park space, spaces, as you mentioned. Uh, families are introduced to the cows and cattle so that kids Kids also can help, uh, you know, to uh, cows, you know, getting feeded and 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 uh, and whatnot. And of course, the buildings are also, you know, low in energy consumption and, uh, for example, less water use. And you, we've also seen, you know, the green buildings, for example, also new um, architectural concepts. For example, you know, those triangle balconies who work, you know, look strange on on the first side, but then again have less shade maybe on the balcony below that. And I think that was also part of the competition among the architects. I mean, for sure, there's a, there's a huge uh, uh, rivalry uh, going on and competition ongoing. And it's uh, altogether kind of uh, stitched together in kind of a showroom form with an experimental character uh, where Danish architects and engineers and master planners and designers are showing kind of best practice uh, within the field. Uh, field of, uh, of this environment. After all, um, the built environment is being seen uh, as, uh, as, a, as a business with potential for export. So uh, yes, in terms of the, uh, the energy, uh, we of course live up to the uh, uh, criteria uh, within European Union. Uh, and we are following uh, that, uh, even though uh, Copenhagen is uh, having vision of becoming CO2 neutral as the first capital city in, uh, in the world, uh, there's, uh, there's of course uh, still huge work uh, to be done on an overall uh, city, city scale level. So in Germany we tend to export our cars. Denmark has a showcase here to export architecture. So we sum up our couple of days here with the EQ road trip and a lot of insight into different fields of sustainability. And first of all, with the car, I mean, exterior wise, it's a cute little one and so special in the whole industry and so short that you make up your own parking spots. That's the biggest advantage of this car. And since we also have it in the endurance test, so we, you know, face some different stuff which is maybe not that well thought out we present you that in the review in the review but then again there are so many positive things about this car and how much how how, how less traffic space it really uses and sometimes i feel you know for example i had the the smart and the gls the mercedes gls at the same time and sometimes we were taking the small car really because you know hey where can we find a parking spot close by well let's take the smart so it is definitely still a genius car on the interior also you know fresh things to um, to discover for sure not a super premium build quality and the price is also quite high especially for the electric versions i mean this is the downside on the other hand you sit quite good also as a tall person in there and the space you have is actually quite well used and especially the combination of the ev and the convertible 
is really super cool. And then we also discovered more sustainable approaches, for example, also with the electric boats or the ferry. And I think we found out that not everything is immediately gold just when it's electric because you also have to produce the batteries and there's also something in you know production and resources always involved and we have to make that better for example you know with new battery systems but which are taking less especially of those you know um, very rare resources we have so there's a lot of research to be done right there but I think when you find something which may make sense like with the small boats that are going you know every day or like with a ferry that can really have a good recharging and sailing cycle for example where you can also combine the sustainable aspects with making it economic at the same time i think that's why we can really achieve something together as well also with the furniture concept you know um where we also had the the idea there to make sustainable things better than the standard conservative things. I think that's a very in interesting approach and we also have to do that with cars and for example, you know, when I say, you know, better take the fabric seats, it's not only because it's more sustainable, it's also because it has, you know, a better functionality. So I think this is a very interesting aspect. Overall, you know, about the climate emissions and, um, you know, the whole global perspective, at the moment you say that traffic only accounts for about 15% of the, you know, of the climate gases. So it's actually not the biggest portion doesn't mean we sh shouldn't do you know anything with, you know with, with cars and so you have to do something in in every little field and you have to start somewhere actually and um, for example at the moment CNG cars are actually very sustainable from the whole perspective from the whole life cycle as well with the electric vehicles of course you have to look at the size of the battery and how much are you actually using them and where you are using them and the small Smart for two is, for example, an example which makes sense really in the inner circle to reduce the emissions on a local basis. And then, of course, when we, you know, as we conclude also with this new urban surrounding here in Erstadt and near to, near Copenhagen, buildings also, you know, and all the heating and stuff make they are one of the biggest portion in the you know, in the whole climate gases. You say about 40 percent, and this is also something where there's a lot of potential. Same goes to the animal agriculture, which is also about 40% if you, you know, take into account that the forests are being cut down to have the, the, the plants just for the animals. Remember, two-thirds of all agricultural land on this planet is not used to feed humans. It's used to feed the animals that are then slaughtered for the humans. So this doesn't really make sense on the long-term run. We, we, we cannot continue that on the long-term run. But we have to start somewhere and you know and, and make little improvements and so i think everyone can do something and when people tell me you know i can't change anything myself you know i'm just one person i think that's that's totally wrong approach then you can for example also stop voting so i think you can start yourself by doing something little and you know just because you do one thing which is good it doesn't mean you have to do everything you know when for example i say um, okay, I'm vegan. I don't eat or wear anything that comes from animals because I think that's the, for me, the easiest thing to do to have the maximum good impact. And then people say, oh, so yeah, then you're not allowed to go on holiday anymore. Then you're not allowed to take the plane. Then you should, you know, knit your own clothes. I think that's totally unrealistic. So we don't have to give up our modern lives just because we do something, you know, to improve it. So, this is you know, a very open perspective here for you today. I hope you could uh, gather a lot of different and very interesting information. And also to give me some feedback if that was you know, interesting to add something more spice to a single car review. Thank you so much for watching. Mal tak for that. Wie See ya.